Okay, so for the next half hour, we're going to discuss the use of CT to image patients who present to you with acute right lower quadrant pain. And hopefully at the conclusion of this lecture, you'll be able to somewhat improve your performance of appendiceal CT studies, utilize some of the new CT criteria that we've adopted in our practice for diagnosing patients with acute appendicitis, and hopefully will increase your ability your sensitivity, maybe specificity a little bit in terms of your ability to detect and characterize some common GI diseases that also present with right lower quadrant pain that are in the differential diagnosis with acute appendicitis. Now, as I think everybody knows, acute appendicitis is the number one cause of acute abdominal pain that requires surgery in developed countries. And in fact, if you look at the surgical and emergency medicine literature, Approximately 25 to 30 percent of patients under the age of 60 who present with acute abdominal pain will ultimately be diagnosed with acute appendicitis. In the United States, individuals carry a lifetime risk of approximately 7 percent for developing this disease. We see at least a quarter of a million cases a year. We spend a lot of money annually on the diagnosis and treatment of this entity. Historically, clinical diagnosis has been based on history and physical exam. And the most important clinical parameter is not the presence of right lower quadrant pain. Rather, it's the presence or the detection of the presence of migratory pain from the periumbilical region to the right lower quadrant. That symptomatology has a very high pretest predictive value for acute appendicitis. And now we have approximately four decades worth of experience that has taught us that the diagnosis of acute appendicitis is most likely to be missed or delayed by clinicians in those patients that have atypical disease presentations as well as women of childbearing age because so many acute gynecologic conditions can present with right lower quadrant pain, and that topic will be discussed uh, later in this course. If we look at clinical data since the mid-1980s, diagnostic accuracy appears to have plateaued for diagnosing acute appendicitis. Approximately 93 percent in males, 83 percent in females, corresponding to approximate negative appendectomy rates of 7, 7 percent and 17 percent, respectively. So it's been proposed that to further improve diagnostic accuracy, to reduce the negative appendectomy rate further, and to drop hospitalization costs, that perhaps imaging should have a much more profound role. And in fact, there have been a host of studies that have shown that in experienced hands, CT now possesses approximately a sensitivity and specificity of 95 percent for the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. Recent studies have also shown that we can decrease the negative appendectomy rate to as low as 4 or 5 percent. And most recently, at this year's RSNA, a study from UCLA has shown with aggressive use of CT that the negative appendectomy uh, rates can drop to as low as 1.5 percent, looking at both male and females combined. Now, in terms of CT technique, at the present time, all popular multi-detector CT techniques involve prospective helical data acquisition of thin section imaging through the abdomen and pelvis. The focused right lower quadrant technique that was so popularized by Patrick Rayo at the MGH is actually uh, no longer used at that institution, and for the most part, this, this technique has been dropped in adult patients. So everyone's scanning the abdomen and pelvis, and what's in play now is whether or not you're using intravenous and enteric contrast agents. The use of unenhanced CT to scan the abdomen and pelvis is a powerful tool for evaluating patients with suspected renal stone disease, but is not to be used when you evaluate patients with suspected appendicitis. And this technique is now used in less than 1 to 2 percent of academic practices in the United States. And first and foremost, the reason is that unless you use intravenous contrast material, you run the risk of missing patients that present with very early forms of acute appendicitis, and we'll discuss that this morning. And in addition, as you can imagine, there's a whole host of diagnostic entities that require the use of intravenous contrast material to establish the correct diagnosis. So the major confrontation, if you will, is if you're going to use intravenous contrast material, do you use enteric contrast or not? At our institution, we strongly believe in the use of enteric contrast. We have a lot of experience imaging patients with acute appendicitis. And the problem is, is that if you don't use oral contrast, it can be difficult to differentiate a mildly distended appendix from adjacent bowel loops. Uh, nevertheless, the use of only intravenous contrast material is uh, growing in presence in the United States. So the technique that we use is we study all of our patients with intravenous and oral contrast agents. There are practices that prefer intravenous and rectal contrast material. The primary advantage is that use of this technique facilitates the diagnosis of acute appendicitis 
as well as just about anything else that you can present in the differential diagnosis. And use of this technique will also increase your level of diagnostic confidence. And here I'm not just talking about my residents or fellows that I work with, but my faculty as well. Now, why is intravenous contrast material so important? I keep this older slide pair in my lecture because it really demonstrates this point. This was a patient who presented with migratory pain to the right lower quadrant. Certainly a male patient, high pretest predictive value. Uh, this patient did not need to have CT, but being in the United States of America, the patient was scanned. Now, there's something that lives north of the right psoas muscle, but without intravenous contrast material, it's impossible to know what that structure is. However, with the bolus of IV contrast material, we can now better interrogate the structure, which turns out to be the appendix. And in fact, we can now appreciate the fact that we're dealing with a mildly inflamed appendix, which lies against a cecal bar or focal region of cecal wall thickening at the medial aspect of the cecum. And now we can establish definitively that, that this patient has acute appendicitis. The CT protocol that we use on our 16 slice scanner is included in your uh, electronic syllabus. This is it here. Suffice to say that we scan our patients with intravenous and oral contrast material. What we do is typically we'll wait an hour after the patient stops stringing. We'll put the patient on the scanner and we'll obtain a single slice through the right lower quadrant to ensure adequate opacification of the ileocecal bowel. If that's not there, we'll take the patient off the table. We'll wait another 15 and 20 minutes. Our surgeons did not have a problem with this. Okay, they want us to establish the correct diagnosis. They're not worried about us introducing a substantial delay in hospitalization of these patients. We used to send, and we still do, the two millimeter thin sections to our PAX uh, workstations, our Leonardo uh, workstations. And typically we would send our thicker slices, four millimeter axial slices, to the PAX archive. However, we found that the reconstructed images are of tremendous use, and we're trying to encourage the faculty to view these images more. So recently, just several months ago, we're now sending our coronal acquisitions, reformatted recons now, directly to PACs as well in patients that present with acute abdominal pain. And we do it uh, much more so than just generating pretty images. In certain cases, they can present uh, pathology to us in a fashion that really gives us an excellent overview of disease. Of course, the coronals will not help us if appendicitis is predominantly presenting in the axial plane, and I'll show you lots of examples of that. But here was a, a, a case, a uh, relatively recent patient presented with right lower quadrant pain. We could appreciate the inflamed appendix arising from the medial aspect of the cecum and the significant amount of inflammation adjacent to the tip of this patient's appendix, a small periappendiceal abscess, and substantial reactive thickening of the terminal ileum. Let's talk about diagnostic criteria. Classically, patients were diagnosed with acute appendicitis if they presented with a mild to moderately distended appendix measuring seven millimeters or more in diameter, measured serosa to serosa, with associated mural thickening, mural enhancement, and periappendiceal inflammation. And classically, the diagnosis of perforation was made if you directly visualized uh, mural discontinuity, basically a hole in the appendiceal wall or a fragmented appendix, or a substantial periappendiceal inflammation. Now, it's been said by some groups that you can't diagnose appendicitis if you don't see the inflamed appendix, uh, but certainly that's not true. And we can make a definitive diagnosis of perforation if we don't see the appendix, but to do so, we have to see a combination of two findings, substantial perisecal inflammation that's noted in association with one or more calcified appendicolates. Now, at our institution, uh, we're much more aggressive in our diagnosis of acute appendicitis, and up to 15% of patients will establish this diagnosis in patients who present with mild distension of the appendix, mural thickening and mural enhancement on a contrast-enhanced study, but patients that don't have periappendiceal inflammation. And in symptomatic adult patients, we'll send these patients right to surgery. We don't use this criteria in the pediatric population. In the pediatric population, we still like to establish the diagnosis of appendicitis when the inflamed appendix presents in association with periappendiceal inflammation. The toughest cases, fortunately, we only see this in approximately 1% to 2% of our patients, are patients who are symptomatic and they simply present with a minimally distended fluid-filled appendix. And the appendiceal wall is normal and the periappendiceal fat is normal. Instead of calling these patients normal, because the patients are symptomatic, what we'll do is we'll raise the suspicion of appendicitis and we'll encourage our surgical colleagues to observe these patients. And we'll refer to these cases as uh, possible or probable or borderline appendicitis.
Now, it's been reported that you can see the normal appendix in up to 100% of normal patients with right lower quadrant pain using the CT technique that we use. We see it in approximately 85% of cases. And the normal appendix can contain air, enteric contrast, or a combination of both. The normal appendix is thin wall, typically measuring 1 millimeter, 1.5 millimeters in thickness or less. And the surrounding fat should be pristine without evidence for inflammation. Let's start with the most subtle cases of appendicitis. So here's a patient who presents with acute right lower quadrant pain. This patient presents with a 6.5 millimeter in diameter appendix. To my eye, the appendiceal wall is normal. The periappendiceal fat is clean. Here's another case. This appendix measures only uh, 6 millimeters. To my eye, I really wouldn't jump on the wall. Again, the fat is jet black. Looks perfectly clean. Both of these patients were observed by the surgeons. Patient symptoms continued to evolve. Both patients were taken to surgery. Histopath diagnosis on both patients, acute appendicitis. Cases like this are a little bit easier. Here's a patient who presents with an 8 millimeter diameter appendix, but clearly this appendix demonstrates mural thickening and enhancement. Despite the fact that the periappendiceal fat is relatively clean, this is an abnormal CT appearance. So we'll jump on a case like this, as well as a case like this, where this appendix is not necessarily so fluid filled but rather we can appreciate abnormal mural thickening. And both of these patients also went to surgery with a path diagnosis of acute appendicitis. Classic cases are not going to be difficult for you to diagnose because you'll appreciate distended tubular appendix, mural thickening, enhancement, the potential internal or external findings of calcified appendiculus as well as periappendiceal inflammation. And if you are able to identify an abnormal appendix with a hole in its wall, you'll be able to jump on the presence of perforation, certainly when seen in association with periappendiceal inflammation. Sometimes you may not appreciate the entire uh, appearance, the, the entire content of a perforated appendix. This was a patient who presents with phlegmon interposed between the inferior tip of the right lobe of the liver and the right psoas muscle. And with the bolus of contrast, we're now able to appreciate the remains of a fragmented perforated appendix. This was a recent case. This was a 26-year-old female presented to our emergency department with right lower quadrant pain. The emergency medicine department diagnosis in this patient was very severe gastroenteritis. We scanned the patient and the initial CT diagnosis was, was rip-roaring pelvic inflammatory disease and peritonitis. And obviously a marked amount of pelvic inflammation with associated thickening a circumferential thickening involving the cecum and the right colon, as well as a cystic mass within the pelvis. The only problem in this case was that the patient history absolutely excluded pelvic inflammatory disease. And then we had to go back to the drawing board, at which point we had four or five people looking at this case. The question was, could we be dealing with perforated appendicitis? And there was a loop that everyone was initially worried about, but the initial thinking was that this loop had to represent inflamed dilium, just because it was so large and so thick-walled. If you carefully look at the loop, depending on how much you had to drink last night, maybe if you use your imagination a little bit, there's an oval-shaped appendicolith within that loop. I can tell you nobody suggested that prospectively. But we did an ultrasound exam on this patient, which proved to be quite complementary. And in fact, we were able to identify an appendicolith within this loop. And this was a case of per, um, perforated appendicitis with an appendicolith on board, secondary marked um, peritonitis and peritoneal inflammation. As I mentioned before, we can diagnose perforation without seeing the appendix. Here are two examples. Both patients present with abnormal inflammatory processes within the right lower quadrant, but we can nail the diagnosis of appendicitis because we can appreciate the presence of one or more calcified appendicolis embedded within the areas of inflammation. Always think about appendicitis when a patient presents with clinical symptomatology of small bowel obstruction in the absence of prior surgery. This is a patient who presents with markedly dilated proximal bowel loops, uh, collapsed distal ileum, and in the vicinity of the transition zone, small focal area of inflammation. And in surgery, this was a patient who had perforated appendicitis as the etiology for the patient's distal intestinal obstruction. Tough cases can present either because the imaging findings are not characteristic, or the pathology lies away from the right lower quadrant, or the patient presents with symptoms that don't make you think that they may have appendicitis. This was a patient who presented with periumbilical left-sided abdominal pain. And at initial CT, the question was raised, well, maybe this patient could have a uh, focal enteritis, maybe jejunitis. The patient was admitted and treated conservatively. 
Follow-up CT study was performed five days later, at which point we were now able to appreciate an evolving interloop abscess containing a gas fluid level. And lo and behold, there was a small density, radiopaque density, which we realized likely represented a calcified appendicolith present at the dependent aspect of that collection, which of course in retrospect was present on the initial CT. And then if we let our eyes glide over to the right lower quadrant, we can see collapsed downstream appendix. So this was a patient with a very long, tortuous appendix, and this was a patient presenting with perforated tip appendicitis. When it comes to scanning the pregnant patient, CT is a very accurate modality to evaluate these patients. However, I would strongly encourage you to consider the use of ultrasound and MR. Ultrasound is probably a lot easier to use in patients in their first trimester compared to second or third trimester. Uh, initially in Europe and now in the United States, MR is having a much more prominent role in evaluating patients with appendicitis. And we can identify the inflamed appendix without the use of gadolinium, and MR is proving to be a powerful tool. And in fact, so powerful that institutions that don't typically offer MR around the clock, 24 by 7 by 365, are now under growing pressure to do so, in part just because of the growth of this particular application. So you may, you may uh, be called upon to do this in your own practice. Okay, let's switch gears, move away from appendicitis and talk about differential diagnosis of right lower quadrant pain, starting with sequel diverticulitis. So sequel diverticulitis is an uncommon entity, but certainly not a rare entity that's often uh, misdiagnosed as acute appendicitis clinically. And we see this in about 4% of patients who present with right lower quadrant pain, but covering uh, CT studies performed at multiple institutions, uh, we see this entity uh, almost once a month. And this results from inflammation and perforation of either acquired or congenital right-sided colonic diverticula. It's always great to establish the diagnosis immediately because the patient can then be treated with antibiotics and you would avoid unnecessary hemicolectomy or diverticulectomy. Differential diagnosis in patients who present with a very sizable pathologic entity uh, may include a perforated sequel cancer, particularly in patients over the age of 50 who present with a very large soft tissue mass at CT. First example. So this was a cute case. This was a very recent case. Patient who presented to us uh, July 30th of this year, this patient uh, presented with path-proven acute appendicitis. 45 days later, the patient returns with right lower quadrant pain. The patient couldn't believe that they had uh, pain in this location again. And in fact, on the initial study, the patient presented with a normal diverticulum rising from the cecum, and we can now see on the follow-up study from September 15th that this is now inflamed. The inflamed diverticulum in this entity may enhance with IV contrast material, contain gas, a fecalith, or enteric contrast. These patients always present with colonic wall thickening, and it can be focal and asymmetric in mild cases, or it may be pretty severe and circumferential in patients who have more severe forms of sequel diverticulitis. And almost always there's evidence for pericolonic inflammation that surrounds the offended diverticulum. Here's an example of a patient where the diagnosis was pretty easy to establish prospectively because we were able to identify either a calcified fecalith or enteric contrast material within the inflamed diverticulum. This patient was treated with antibiotics showing resolution of these findings. I think the toughest cases are the ones where you don't appreciate the inflamed diverticulum. This was a patient where we had path proof because this patient went to surgery thinking that maybe this patient had perforated appendicitis, and quite honestly, it was a normal appearing appendix that was present on the scan, but this was prospectively missed. This patient presents with focal abnormal mural thickening involving the lateral wall of the cecum with pericecal inflammation that extends out to the peritoneum that's thickened and enhancing. Here's another patient. This patient presents with right lower quadrant pain, focal thickening, medial wall of the cecum with an associated bilobed abscess collection. Both of these patients uh, went to surgery and both had surgical and pathologic evidence of perforated sequel diverticulitis. Uh, 3D reformatting can be quite helpful in these, in, uh, th in these cases to uh, establish that, in fact, an abnormality may represent an inflamed diverticulum. I think this was a case that Mike McCary worked up several years back. This was a patient who, present, who presents with right mid-abdominal abdominal pain. The abnormality involves the right colon, uh, just south of the hepatic flexure. We can appreciate abnormal mural thickening involving the right colon, as well as a small focal tract of barium. Certainly suspicious for a little bit of 
contrast material within an inflamed diverticulum. And here we have a volume rendered 3D view, nicely showing extrinsic serosal pad effect on the hepatic flexure and a little bit of contrast material uh, penetrating the site of that perforated diverticulum. Differential diagnosis, primary epiploic appendagitis. Uh, this entity results in torsion of the uh, pedunculated epiploic appendices, which you all remember are normal fat-laden structures that line the serosal surface of the colon extending from the level of the cecum to the rectosigmoid junction. Uh, this entity can also result from spontaneous venous thrombosis of the draining vein of these small fatty structures. This is an uncommon but fortunately self-limiting entity and in a retrospective study was seen in 2% of patients who present with lower abdominal pain, 1% of patients who presented with right lower quadrant pain. These patients typically present with very sudden onset of focal pain that's worse with coughing, deep inspiration, or stretching. Extremely rare to establish this diagnosis in the ED department. What are the findings? So the findings are extremely characteristic. We're looking for a pedunculated fat attenuation mass that typically measures 5 cm or less that's intimately associ associated with the serosal surface of the colon. You should only establish a diagnosis if this abnormality of fat contains a peripheral hyperattenuating rim, particularly in the right side of the bowel. It's extremely common to see associated focal mass effect on the underlying colon and variable degrees of pericolonic inflammation. If the inflammation extends out to the peritoneum, that will also demonstrate thickening and enhancement. The primary uh, differential diagnosis for this entity is an even rarer entity, and that's right-sided uh, segmental infarction of the omentum. This is a self-limited condition that can also mimic appendicitis. These patients present with sudden onset of right lower quadrant or right mid-abdominal pain. And the theory here, and it's a theory because to my knowledge this has never been uh, proven, is that in some unlucky individuals the omentum may have a congenitally anomalous and fragile blood supply that's susceptible to infarction. Now the abnormality in adult patients is in a very characteristic location. They present with an abnormality of the fat in the, in the anterolateral abdomen, almost always interposed between the peritoneum and the ascending colon just at or slightly above the level of the umbilicus. What are we looking for? Well, we're looking for an abnormality of the fat, but here the abnormality of the fat is larger than what we see in patients with PEA. And the fat abnormality can range in size from 5 to 10 centimeters. Very common to see internal areas of inflammation, hyperattenuating streaks, stranding, or fluid within the inflamed fat, but characteristically, the underlying bowel is normal. You will not see evidence for reactive thickening. And quite commonly, there's associated thickening and enhancement of the peritoneum. Perforated cecal carcinomas can present uh, in, with a clinical picture that can sometimes mimic acute appendicitis. We know that 25% of colorectal cancers arise in the cecum and the ascending colon. And if not appropriately screened prospectively, these patients may be symptomatic and they may present with an iron deficiency anemia or intestinal obstruction. Uh, fortunately, from a diagnostic perspective, these cases are not difficult to differentiate from perforated appendicitis because on CT, these abnormalities, these pathologic processes usually appear as very large abnormal soft tissue masses with gross evidence of transmural extension. Now this is an older case. This was a patient who presented to the emergency department at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. And the ED physicians were pretty convinced that this patient presented with perforated appendicitis and a palpable abscess. Uh, we scan the patient and of course that's not what we're able to appreciate from an imaging perspective. This patient's presenting with a larger, with a large sizable soft tissue mass demonstrating eccentric thickening along the anterior aspect, uh, heterogeneous enhancement with focal regions of suspected neural necrosis, inflammation that extends from the anterior aspect of this mass to the peritoneum which is thickened and, and enhancing and there is associated regional lymphadenopathy. Pretty easy to establish the diagnosis here. Neutropenic enterocolitis, aka tiflitis, is within our differential diagnosis uh, when restricted to patients that have the appropriate history. This is an acute inflammatory and necrotizing process of typically multifactorial origin that it can involve the cecum, the terminal ileum, cecum and the TI, sometimes the small bowel, the large bowel, or combination thereof. Uh, it's primarily a complication of chemotherapy-induced agranulocytosis. Bacterial and fungal agents play a major role. It's not unusual to see coexistent ischemia, sometimes coexistent neoplastic infiltration of the bowel wall. Uh, 
usually the patients will present with known risk factors and you'll receive a CT request that'll say neutropenic patient on chemotherapy, new onset right lower quadrant pain, fever, rule out tiflitis, tiflitis, tiflitis. Uh, but you may not always receive that history and it's important to ascertain if the patient is potentially uh, neutropenic or not. And it's also important to correctly establish this diagnosis because when the diagnosis is missed, these patients may develop transmural necrosis and serious cases of bowel perforation. Now, in most instances, the CT findings are entirely nonspecific. And this was a patient with breast cancer, treated with bone marrow transplantation. The patient was neutropenic, presents with right lower quadrant pain. She's presenting with abnormal mural thickening of the cecum, proximal right colon with an abnormal uh, enhancement stratification pattern, mural stratification pattern on a contrast enhanced CT. So the CT findings are not pathognomonic, but in combination with the patient history, we're able to establish this diagnosis. This is a case that I keep in the talk because this was a patient with neutropenic enterocolitis who presents with focal pneumatosis. And it's important to remember that even in the setting of focal pneumatosis, if the patients are responding well to conservative management, they do not necessarily have to go to surgery. And this particular patient did very well with conservative management and did not need to undergo bowel resection. This entity can come on in an extremely rapid fashion. This was a leukemic patient who underwent a staging abdominal pelvic CT. Right lower quadrant was normal. Patient was put on chemotherapy and four days after being on chemotherapy developed acute sudden onset right lower quadrant pain. Patients presenting with abnormal mural thickening of both terminal ileum as well as the cecum as well as both pneumatosis and extraluminal air representing focal perforation. And of course, a patient like this will need to go to surgery and undergo iliosegmental right uh, colonic resection. Mesenteric adenitis has long known to be an appendicitis mimicking disorder, most commonly seen in children and young adults. This is a self-limited condition that results from benign inflammation of the ileal mesenteric lymph nodes. Very common to see coexistent inflammation of the TI and or the cecum. Common offending agents include Yersinia subspecies, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Mycobacterium. And here the differential diagnosis is does this patient have an infectious ileocecitis? Sometimes a radiologist will see an abnormality of the underlying bowel and they'll give the patient a diagnosis of uh, infection of the bowel rather than a diagnosis of mesenteric adenitis or possibly Crohn's disease. Uh, we'll jump on this diagnosis whenever patients present with right lower quadrant pain. We see a normal appendix and we see conglomeration of enlarged lymph nodes. And specificity, as you can imagine, climbs as lymph node size increases. But really looking for clusters of lymph nodes, seven millimeters or more in size within the right lower quadrant. And it always helps if there's underlying abnormal mural thickening of the bowel. And this was a case from the MGH given to me years ago. And here this was mesenteric adenitis due to uh, infection of the terminal ileum in the proximal right colon. Differential diagnosis certainly includes that of Crohn's disease. Now this was a patient who presented to our emergency department without any known prior history of Crohn's disease. So the first thing that we do, and I always treat, uh, teach my house staff to do this, is we always search for the appendix. And in this case, we were lucky. We were able to identify the appendix, thin-walled appendix containing some air, so we were able to exclude the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. Then, of course, the pathologic entity jumps on us. So this patient's presenting with abnormal mural thickening involving a relatively long segment of bowel, distal and terminal ileum, with associated fibrofatty proliferation. And when you see fibrofatty proliferation involving the ileal mesentery, you should really jump on these cases for Crohn's disease. And in addition, we could appreciate a small lymph node within the ileal mesentery, as well as injected vasorecta, the so-called comb sign of acute Crohn's disease. So this was a patient presenting with Crohn's disease without any significant complications. We typically think of diverticulitis as a pathologic process that presents with left lower quadrant pain. But that's not necessarily the case, and it's certainly not necessarily the case if the area of inflammation arises in the vicinity of the apex of the sigmoid colon or in patients that have a very large floppy sigmoid where the sigmoid can move all over the pelvis. So this was an interesting case. This was a patient who presented with uh, acute lower abdominal pain, a little bit worse in the right lower quadrant. And we scanned the patient and the question really came down to, did this patient have appendicitis or perforated diverticulitis? Now we were able to identify the appendix and the appendix appeared abnormal. 
but we weren't certain if the appendix looked abnormal because it was secondarily inflamed, secondary to diverticulitis, or was the appendix abnormal because it perforated. In addition, we had some important associated findings. Uh, the presence of other colonic diverticula, inflammation uh, focally related to the sigmoid colon apex, as well as reactive thickening of the reflection of the sigmoid mesocolon, which is a very strong finding uh, seen in patients with uh, perforated diverticulitis. And the most signi significant finding in this case was the presence of a small focal abscess containing a little bit of gas really interposed between the apex of the sigmoid colon and the appendix. So what do you do? Well, I was fortunate because I read this case and I knew this patient. I knew this patient had a prior episode of diverticulitis. So I knew that this patient was very high risk for diverticulitis. And the patient was treated for diverticulitis and the patient subsequently did well prior to undergoing subsequent colonic resection. Uh, but sometimes these cases can be quite difficult to differentiate. And in such cases, a contrast enema uh, can be complementary and help you get a second look at that appendix. And sometimes you'll see an obstructing appendicolith that may not necessarily be apparent on an, uh, an imaging study such as CT. So in conclusion, certainly there are many clinical entities that present with acute right lower quadrant pain. We think the best approach is always to first try to exclude acute appendicitis and then consider alternative diagnoses. We haven't really talked about the pediatric population that much this morning. Uh, certainly, you want to consider ultrasound as your first line imaging modality in pediatric patients. Ultrasound possesses a high specificity and positive predictive value for appendicitis, no ionizing radiation. In pregnant patients, I would consider ultrasound strongly in the first trimester, assuming that you have the expertise available around the clock to deliver that service. If not, I would strongly consider that you start to use MR to evaluate patients with suspected appendicitis, particularly patients in the second and third trimester, where ultrasound may be more difficult to perform. And finally, when clinically indicated, certainly as I've hoped to show you this morning, an optimized CT study should enable a rapid and correct diagnosis in the overwhelming majority of patients who present with acute right lower quadrant pain.